Why do we travel? Jet lag, sickness, stomach aches, a general sense of confusion, expenses, early morning red-eye flights, the possibility of eating in the worst restaurants and staying in pest-infested hotel rooms. We pack our bags mind-numbingly, always confused about what to bring. Brave airport traffic, subject ourselves to being searched, patted down, unclothed at times. To be faced with hundreds of tiny, tedious, yet all-important daily decisions. And all that even before leaving. Once in the plane, you're sweaty, clueless as to what to do for the next hour or day even. Sitting, waiting, and hoping patiently. We were for the longest time nomadic people always on the move, going through worse travel conditions than what we have today, to find greener pastures, new lands, and shiny opportunities. Today, most of us sit in front of our computers, hopefully doing a job we enjoy, to pay bills and taxes at the end of the month, to continuously live the same routine at every new dawn. We travel to break the norm, to attempt to regain a sense of adventure, arriving in foreign ports exhausted yet immediately fulfilled. It is human nature to challenge the rule of monotony and continuously be curious. Whether it's peeking at your partner's phone over their shoulder or perversely watching how citizens of a different country eat, interact, or kiss. I travel to search for discomfort, to be put in situations that don't make sense, to push my mind to think beyond my daily routine, to learn and become a better version of myself, to realize what I've been doing wrong and how I can mimic the good I find in other cultures, and to feel small, humble, and consequent, and at all with the world we live in. I travel to be real, to go back to what it means to being human, to munch on life one morsel at a time. After our food binge in Osaka, and before we even attempt to cover the immensity of Tokyo, I wanted to experience Japan under a different light. Fukuoka is part of the island of Kyushu, which sits at the most southern part of the archipelago. This region is mostly known for having the most active volcano, Mount Aso, lots of hot springs, the unfortunate event of the atomic bomb being dropped on Nagasaki, Saga origin beef, the Ryukyu Islands that extend all the way to Taiwan, and finally, Japan's fifth largest, most overlooked city, Fukuoka. This may sound like you might be arriving in another jungle of buildings, affronted by flashing lights and large billboards you can't even read. But you'll be pleasantly surprised by how different the city is from the top four. There's just something so very beachy in the air. Not only are you geographically right by the sea, but you actually feel like the ocean is right there, which sometimes is not the case in large coastal metropolitan cities. But before we get into it, I wanted to show you that I've grown. I have finally gathered enough patience to figure out how to properly put together an onigiri. Make this a tradition each time you land anywhere in the country. You'll arrive at the Fukuoka airport, which is conveniently located 15 minutes and just 260 yen, roughly three American dollars from the Hakata area. The city's main areas are Hakata and Tenjin, both central locations with everything from amazing food at every corner, as I'm starting to discover seems to be customary in Japan, different styles of shopping and cultural landmarks. From these two areas, you can discover the rest of the city's neighborhoods, which are never really far from each other, and all connected through an unhurried and easy-to-navigate subway system. A lot of you are probably wondering, why Fukuoka? I mean, you know, there's Tokyo, we went to Osaka, yes, but we could have gone to Tokyo, we could have gone south to Okinawa, we could have gone to Hokkaido to cover the skiing and everything. Uh, so why come to this really unknown city that no one's heard about? Everyone kept asking us, why would we choose this? Well, I'm a firm believer that traveling is all about exploring, right? It's about trying to do things differently, trying things that are new, that are completely foreign to you. This destination was available to us, so we thought it would be the opportunity of going to a place where there's not much written about the city and see what we could actually draw out of it. We are pleasantly surprised by what everything looks like. I'm in a car, driving an old school Nissan, learning how to drive on the left side of the road in Japan. Um, I'm in my printed shirt. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna have good food, good drinks, we're gonna meet cool people. What's not to love, man? A couple of things struck me while walking around Fukuoka. 
One, the city looks like the trendiest 80s inspired design location I've seen in a while. It gives you nostalgic modernity in a very humble demeanor. Second, you may actually feel like you were just exploring. Unlike Tokyo, Osaka, or even Seoul or Shanghai, which are not far, there aren't many landmarks and must-see monuments in the city. In fact, I believe that you should come here just to experience a laid-back Japanese lifestyle that will make you feel like you actually live in the city. They manage to blend everything from high to low-end restaurants, shops, museums, local and international brands in a vibrant, open-minded, and seamless way. It seems like an overnight tradition nowadays to start off the trip, which is the big bowl of hot broth, thick noodles, lots of chili, and a big black bowl that conveys all this heat, warmth, and just even though it's really hot, like you cannot say no to this. Check this out. Udon noodles, beautiful, bouncy, absolutely gorgeous and thick. Lots of spring onions, nice chunky pork. What? Pork with tempura, who knew that could happen? and a nice tempura, and all of this is just pure ginger. Mix that in, I'll give it the broth a taste first. That's delicious. That's like they took the tempura sauce, everyone knows they want to drink at the table. I know you do it, I do it all the time. And they put it as a soup, absolutely glorious. I'm gonna try one of these chicken caragas here with sauce already. Why do people eat KFC? Who the hell needs KFC? Just come to Japan, eat this stuff, it still starts with a K, and it's just better. Much better. It's really important that you get your imminent first food craving out of the way so that you can concentrate on everything else a little better. You probably never heard of Fukuoka, and fair enough. It doesn't necessarily pop up in most Japan destination searches, but the city has everything you could want. For culture, check out a Warhol or two in the interesting Fukuoka Art Museum or go to the Asian Art Museum. For nature, the peaceful Ohori Park or Momochi Seaside. Hip shopping in the Daimu district, the many small hard to find restaurants and bars around Imaizumi, or the department stores in Tenjin and Hakata. You'll never be far from things to experience, but you will also never feel pressured to have to tick certain things off your list. Take your time walking the main avenues, back streets, talking to surprisingly approachable locals, grab a beer on the beach, and feel like you belong. I mean, isn't this kind of the dream? Perfect soft serve ice cream, just like the Japanese know how to do it. A nice cold Corona. A day by the beach. Amazing wind, nice and refreshing. Completely different from any side of Japan you've ever seen in your life. For me, this is kind of like just the perfect assembly of different things. People in Hawaiian shirts, you've got Mambo Italiano playing on the speakers. You're missing out if you're not here. Another noteworthy feature of the city is its proximity to the sea and its position as a transportation hub to explore the whole island. While you could do this by train, I actually found it easier for the first time to experience driving in Japan and just going wherever we pleased. Our first stop was the area of Dazaifu to visit its Tenmangu shrine. These can be found all over the country. This particular shrine is dedicated to the spirit of Sugawara Mishazane, a scholar buried under the structure, who has been linked to Tenjin, the Shinto deity of learning. You could also make your way towards the sleepy city of Yanagawa, known for its Venice-like canals, singing boatmen, and marvelous unani. I'm pretty much sure I'm two shades darker now after being on that little river cruise, if you want to call it that. We're in Yanagawa, and that was really kind of chill boat ride. I didn't understand anything he was saying, but he basically talks about the history of the town and the importance of the town and the network of canals that are all around us and how he navigates through them and stuff. It's, it, it was a really cool experience, really fun. And their specialty here is actually from that river, and it is unagi. Perfect 
eel, just nice and sweet the way I like it. Teriyaki glaze, usually some sort of, I guess this is, it looks like very paper thin eggs, noodles that they're making here. Rice, a bunch of pickles and soup. This is for me. That's different. I'm usually not a massive fan of eel just because I find it sometimes it's really fatty and just not very tasty when we have it in the Philippines. But here, that's the proper way of doing it. With a car, there's just so much freedom with your itinerary, and it's quite easy to navigate your way around the island. If we had more time, we would have definitely explored the agricultural areas of Hita, rushed over to Saga to devour some Wagyu, or hiked some of the neighboring mountains and volcanoes. So if you do come here, take a couple of days just to drive through the different cities and areas in the region. Here you go, here you go, here you go. Back. Uh. Yo, 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 yo. Fukuoka, what? Fuck Oaka, what does that mean? I don't know, Wadaka. <laughs> Cause when I go to the place and we go into the beach and the temples, we're here in Japan, sushi, ramen, everything's the same. Oh, amen. <laughs> Each time I'm next to the sea, I always feel like it calls to me, like an innate yearning that I can never really truly shake off. So we headed towards the area of Itoshima. Driving through the winding coastal roads reminded me of the North Shore of Honolulu, with dramatic vistas, little surf outposts, Kea Beach, a gentle continuous hum of waves, and that unquantifiable surfer personality. This is one of the highlights of the trip. I almost wish we could have stayed in a hotel there, waiting for waves and just shutting off for a while. Another draw would be the many large warehouse-like seafood restaurants where you can buy the freshest fare and grill it straight on your own table. And if you're lucky enough to be around during oyster season, eat to your heart's desire. We got slightly distracted by all of it and forgot that we were in a subtropical climate, prone to typhoons during typhoon season, and got stormed on pretty hard. This delayed our dinner plans dramatically and we were forced to cancel on our reservation in one of the many great sushi counter restaurants back in the city. So because of a lack of options and my love for convenience stores, we did the next best thing. So we got rained on really strongly, which explains the story behind the shirt. It says, it says surfer, cute little kind of girl surfing. And then behind me, it says fucking girl, because I couldn't go in the store because I was completely drenched, basically in my boxers and cam op number one over here, decided it'd be a good idea to buy me a surfer girl shirt. So now I look like an absolute idiot. So skipping all that, we wanted to have a really great last meal, but we couldn't actually go out because it was just too rainy and it's still raining now. So we thought let's go to Lawson's and see what we can come up with in terms of dishes. And can we make something really delicious and decadent with what we can get in a convenience store here? Um, and I think we can. Ramen noodles, open that up, a flavor packet, hot water, and I'm just gonna wait for all that to kind of cook down properly. Second dish of meatballs I found. Put that in my pan here. And one of my burger steaks. Squeeze all that beauty. Curry sauce. Oh mama. Oh mama. That's a calorie bomb. Pickles. Mago. Boiled egg. Bacon wrap. Chicken. Pickles. Rice. Let's now check on our ramen noodles. Perfectly cooked just how you want them. So mix in the chili, the powder, dried herbs, baby. Mix that in. Two bowls out, start with the broth, noodles, egg, chicken, pickles, spicy chicken, fried ramen, boiled egg, pickles, absolute perfection. Look at these beauties. Two plates out, rice, meatballs, hamburger, sauce. Tamago, green spinach, with sesame. Dish two is complete. There you have it, two dishes made out of convenience store food. Anywhere else in the world, convenience store food would not look this good, man. If you had these two dishes in front of you, would you not eat them? I think I would. As a boy, I remember the kettle going off in the kitchen, the sound of taste, steam pouring out of it like an angry train, spitting water from the top, 
singeing my skin delicately. When I returned some time after, the hard part was over. The bubbles subsided, allowing me to dispense almost opaque feverish water into my cracked ceramic cup. I diligently over poured in my sweet cacao powder and beat it excitedly. The toaster called, always unexpected yet awaited, a firecracker on New Year's Eve. I burned my fingertips pulling out the toast, needing a knife to get out the rest, always walking the fine line of danger and instant gratification. It lays there on the breakfast table, releasing faint moisture, ready to be lathered with salted butter and the sound of scraping sand on a hard surface. The anticipation talked to me, brought me to places I couldn't imagine. Hotline kitchens, cold stools and cozy diners, sipping on tea on a frosted wooden porch in the dead of winter. Places I knew I would eventually discover, and always through food. Make sure to grab your artisanal coffee fix in Rec Coffee, Rancan Coffee, or Manu Coffee where we were. Just like everything in this great nation, food is a religion to abide by. Fukuoka has actually given you more than you think. Ever heard of Ichiran or Ipudo? Well, they're both from here. Hakata Ramen is a Fukuoka specialty, and after having one at Shinshin, my head was spinning with delicious fat. Another great option for ramen is Sora no Iro. The city is littered with the most amazing restaurants. Tenzushi has to be the most famous one, considered one of the best and extremely respected. Just make sure you book it in advance. Other standouts include Yamanaka, Yakitori Daishizen, Toriden, Hakata Motsunabe Hake, Jambo Hanare, Sushi Sakati, Sato, Yakitori Musashi, Seimon Barai, Chikai, and Kiharu. With that list, you should already have a great variety to try. Before leaving, always make sure you check out the food court basements of any department store in Japan. They are usually the best places to grab any variety of specialties that you can bring home for your friends. Fukuoka is also known for certain particular dishes and experiences to look out for. The most famous ones being yatai and mentaiko, beautiful fish roe. So when walking around a city, you'll see a lot of these food stalls kind of strewn all over the place. They're called yatai. So basically, they're these tiny kind of like self-sufficient kitchen slash bars where we can find absolutely everything from the region, from Korea, from China, and basically just people serving about eight to five people. People have a good time over here. I think because it's so hot and humid, people really enjoy just eating outside. And the variety you can find here is absolutely crazy. It's about 10.30 p.m. and we're just hungry, man. We just want a good meal, give me some noodles, and everyone will be happy, trust me. Each region of Japan has its own nabe hot pot cooking style. In Fukuoka, they have mitsutake and mostu hot pots. We headed first for some mitsutake, a delicate chicken bone broth style, and a temple of chicken. Right now what we're having is a chicken hot pot. Um, so the idea here basically is to grab the broth, put that in the glass, and then you just sip the broth from here. And that flavor is just, I don't know if you've ever tried, maybe it's comparable to ginseng chicken soup in, in Korea. It's more or less like that. It's just very clean and beautiful. Um, so let's fish around here to see what we have. So little chicken meatballs. Such a clean flavor. And that's served with rice, some pickles. So this is where you really get your sodium, your salt and everything. These set meals are fantastic. I love set meals. They'll start you off kind of really fragrant and light and then they'll move you on to kind of heavy and just the main part of the dish. But before all that, since we love overeating in overnight, nice pun, we ordered some chicken sashimi. You might have seen this before and a lot of people always say chicken sashimi is you can't eat chicken raw or anything. But talking to chefs here in Japan, they say if they know the provenance of the chicken, they know what it's eating, they know what it's from, why wouldn't it be safe? We eat raw cows, we eat all these things. So I've actually never tried raw chicken before. So it kind of freaks me out just because I've been conditioned to think that this is bad and you shouldn't be eating this. But I do feel like I'm in good hands. So I'll dip that in the sauce. It's just weird to see raw chicken breast since I, I work with chicken so much. There you go. It tastes like a smoked ham. Um, they probably do some sort of smoking there, but that's that's delicious. Served with a little chopped chicken here. The chopped chicken tastes like pork. 
The smoked chicken tastes like smoked salmon. Always, you're in a chicken place, obviously you want some nice parage, which we had, and then some nice roast chicken here. Black pepper, pungent. This is really not the type of food you expect from Japan because it's so flavorful and so strong. And finally, we got this rice meal thing with probably some eggs in there and some chicken as well and some onions. So kind of like a, I guess a chicken style yudon. I like that the chicken's almost just half cooked. It's fully cooked, but it feels half cooked. So I guess they don't really care about those kinds of like predicaments where you need that chicken to be bone dry, cooked all the way. Half is just fine and that texture is so much better. And the flavor seriously is just delicious. We then tried the matsu style, which is a sukiyaki style dish with offal and leeks in different variations. Just had some of the craziest oxtail in the world. Fatty, but very smoky. All those flavors you want. Now in front of us we have motsunabe. So motsunabe is actually a really popular dish in Fukuoka because it comes from Fukuoka. And it's just this massive kind of stone pot casserole that they have here. And they put a bunch of raw ingredients in there, mostly pork, oil, wild beef, things like that. A uh, bunch of vegetables, and just a tad bit of sauce. And you've got this beautiful kind of just like slow cooked dish in front of you that you want to eat right away. Everything from intestines to stomach lining to beef to onions, spring onions. It's actually quite a low-cal dish full of all the cheap cuts and just good for your health because it's nice and hearty. Let's try this out. All the guts and stuff are really clean and that flavor is just what you come to expect from Japanese flavors. Some soy, some umami, some ginger, some sesame. Everything just comes together beautifully in this. You can discover a lot by taking a stroll down the river here. Case in point, we found a quaint little food market where you can sip on a whiskey highball and munch on wood oven pizzas while listening to a karaoke set. Thank you. <laughs> we just stumbled upon this little node market happening. It's not Japanese food. We're drinking highballs, which is very Japanese, which I really do enjoy. And we're eating just some really kind of legit stone oven pizza that he made. Some grilled meats with this guy from Peruvian with a daughter that's half Japanese, half Peruvian, and some pork from a local farmer here. It's just such a great way to kind of get the pulse of the city. And I think Fukuoka is all about that. It's just kind of just going with everything and talking to the locals. People here are so nice, they're so friendly, they smile at you. The level of English is actually pretty surprising, and yeah, just enjoy yourself. I'm here, whiskey highball, pizza. I mean, yes, we're in Japan, but how can this not make you happy? Big slice. I mean, man, I'm, I'm a sucker for cheese, and I'm a sucker for whiskey, so. Not complaining. Or duck unknowingly into one of the best tempura experiences I've ever had. If you want more fried delicacies, make sure to also check out Tempura Takeuchi. Night falls and things get weird again, and I couldn't be happier. Nightlife is always a blur in Japanese cities. We ended up walking into a random party in a sub-basement tailor slash design studio, headed by the personable Toru Ikeda, who turns his studio into a bar at night that can probably fit only 10 people, but we managed to squeeze in about 20. All strangers, all drinking together, and starting up random conversations in broken English and enthusiastic sign language. There will never be a shortage of bars in the city. You could head on to the more raucous and lively Oyafukudori, which translates into disrespectful child street, where sinks are conveniently placed on the sidewalk should you need to vomit on your way home or even before hitting another club. We were told to go to Club X, Happy Cock, Brick Sound Bar, or Two Dogs, but we opted not to, preferring to stay in bars such as Bar Leon, Akatan, Dossi, Bar Oscar, Zukun Ingen, Momota, and having an amazing discussion about music with the tender of the tiny glam rock bar.
You don't come to Fukuoka to go over a checklist of things to do. You come to experience an exciting city that has one of the highest economic growth rates in Japan, a portal to one of the most beautiful regions in the country, a place that has so much to offer but does not know yet how to brand itself to the outside world. You come here to have a secret, your own personal Japanese experience that you can't wait to share with everyone you know, to truly explore and immerse yourself in a foreign culture. And as such, I leave you with the breathtaking words of Haruki Murakami. Sometimes fate is like a small sandstorm that keeps changing directions. You change direction, but the sandstorm chases you. You turn again, but the storm adjusts. Over and over you play this out, like some ominous dance with death just before dawn. Why? Because this storm isn't something that blew in from far away, something that has nothing to do with you. This storm is you, something inside of you. So all you can do is give in to it, step right inside the storm, closing your eyes and plugging up your ears so that the sand doesn't get in, and walk through it, step by step. There's no sun there, no moon, no direction, no sense of time. Just fine white sand swirling up into the sky like pulverized bones. That's the kind of sandstorm you need to imagine. And you really will have to make it through that violent metaphysical symbolic storm. No matter how metaphysical or symbolic it might be, make no mistake about it. It will cut through flesh like a thousand razor blades. People will bleed there, and you will bleed too. Hot, red blood. You'll catch that blood in your hands, your own blood, and the blood of others. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure in fact whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what the storm's all about. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to check out our other overnight episodes in Hanoi and Osaka. Also make sure to watch out for Overnight Shiargao and we have a little stop in Cebu. Make sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat for updates and behind the scenes pictures and videos. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Overnight is brought to you by our good friends at Cebu Pacific and here's a quick travel hack to make your travel life easier. You know that person when you're going through security that's always fumbling for things, taking off the belt and the shoes and the jacket and everything? I tell people to always travel hand ready, which means get a backpack or get a bag where you can really reach anything with your hands. That way you don't need to keep things in your pockets. Always travel with pants that don't necessarily need a belt and travel with shoes that you can just slip in and out of. Oh yeah, you didn't.